welcome. This interview is with my dear friend, Nikki Lee, who I don't know if you can hear the noise in the background. She's currently in Bali. <laughs> Um, and the purpose of this interview is to take you through a series of Ayurvedic practices that are essentially off the mat practices that you get to incorporate into your daily routine if you feel called to do so. So before we begin, I'm going to throw over to you, Nikki, so you can introduce yourself and why it is that I would have you here and be asking you all of the Ayurveda things. Yes. Hi, Karina. So happy to be with you, sit with you. It always feels so good to connect and so grateful to share for uh, all the people out there. Uh, yes, there was like the birds are just having a great day out here in um, in Bali. So yeah, um, I want to share a little bit about Ayurveda. As you, as you actually, maybe you all don't know, but um, I studied yoga with under Karina and did all my 500 hour uh, teacher trainings with that. And since I first started learning about yoga and the sister science of Ayurveda, um, I was like very, very much drawn to it. And so I started to dabble into Ayurveda throughout the years. And then it wasn't until a year and a half ago that I did my 300 hour Ayurvedic health coach training. And I did that through the Shakti school, which is a um, feminine form Ayurveda and tantric training that is specifically geared towards women or people identifying as women. And I'm currently in year two of that to become an Ayurvedic health counselor. And so I'm about maybe halfway through um, that, that course, maybe a little less than that now. And so, yeah, I just kind of want to share some of the the little things that have helped integrate these really wise practices into my daily life. It's something that I'll um, recommend as well when I work one-on-one -on -one with people um, to infuse uh, just Ayurvedic rituals uh, along with, you know, yogic principles um, to just find more balance in, in life and just be a little bit more shiny and bright in the best versions of ourselves. So that's what we'll, we'll share. Uh, I'll share today. And um, I've actually st just started working with Shakti school where I've been studying um, as one of their coaches. So if anyone is interested in studying with the, with the school, you can have a chat with me and we can set up a little 30 minute chat and answer any questions around that school. There's Lots and lots of different teachers that come in and out doing and sharing their specialty around Ayurveda. So it's been really a cool school to be a part of because for one, it's online. So, you know, you can do it whenever. Um, and then you connect with people around the world, which I love. Um, and then you just get to learn from, from lots of, lots of different women and, and a few men, um, about just this, which sometimes, you know, Ayurveda can be so simple and also so complicated. So trying to find the simplicity in it is, is I think, an important part of the way that I want to share it. And also being able to, you know, lead us, lead everyone back to the intuitive understanding that we already have of living with the cycles of nature and listening to our own bodies and honoring the seasons and where we're at in our time of life and what we're doing. And um, I really feel like when we know ourselves better, that allows us to do the things that are going to keep us in, in balance better. So uh, I've kind of broken it down. So I'll share with you by dosha, but also I'll share um, a tridoshic practice. If you're like, I don't know if my vata needs to be pacified. I have no idea. And then you could just be like, oh, we'll start with the tridoshic practices, which means that they're going to be balancing for everyone. And, um, you know, the more that we know, the more that we learn, the, the more that things will start to make more sense. Amazing. So one of the things that you said before we hit record that you were going to do was share for each uh, dosha uh, something that would be part of a dinacharya 
practice. And so mm-hmm. for people who are like, what is Dinacharya? Mm-hmm. Could you um, define that? Yeah, so Dinacharya is just a Sanskrit word that means our daily rituals. So it's something that we can do every single day or as much as and often as we can, because the reality is that life is wild and sometimes we don't have time every single day. And I think we can be gentle with ourselves and honor that that if that doesn't happen every day, we are not going to go to, you know, be in Ayurvedic trouble (laughs) or the the sages won't be upset. Um, You know, we got to honor where we're at every day. But yeah, so Dinacharya are just these these rituals that are that I'll share specifically around self care practices. So it's the the yoga off the mat that we can do. Awesome. So what mm-hmm. do you want to start with, butter pitta or kapha? I think I was going to start with the tridoshic version, so like everyone could keep their ears peeled and know that this can be helpful for all. Um, one of the very first practices that I I try to get all of my students and clients doing if they aren't already doing is tongue scrape. And so it's like such a simple thing because we're already conditioned to brush our teeth. Like that's something that we learned as little kids that we brush our teeth in in the morning. And so all you have to do is add in like a little metal or copper tongue scraper into your toothbrush jar and get that done. Um, the, the great thing about doing this first thing in the morning before you eat anything is that we will exc- excrete a lot of toxins or what we call ama out of the mouth when we're sleeping. And so this practice just helps us to scrape that coating off of the tongue first thing in the morning so that we already start off a little bit more purified as we begin our day. Another really great part about tongue scraping is that you are going to look in the mirror and check out your tongue which already starts to inform you, you know, what what did I do yesterday? What did I eat? What was I doing? And how can I see if that has thrown me off of balance or has kept me in balance? And so a lot of times if we're seeing a thick white coating on the tongue, that seems like you've got to scrape it like 10 or more times and it's still white coating, that could be a sign of a kapha imbalance. If we see that the, the coating is a little bit more darker brown, that could be more of a vata imbalance. And if the coating is more yellow, that would be maybe more of a pitta imbalance. And if you're like, oh, there's really not too much that I'm scraping off, then like gold stars because you didn't have too many toxins. And so all you got to do with this is stick out the tongue, take it from the back of the tongue, scrape it forward, and then I'll like run it under the sink and rinse the the ama that's on it and before before scraping again. You do it as many times as you feel like you need to do it until you're done. So some people that might be three times, some people that may be 12 times. And I think we just, again, all of this stuff, like these, are, this is the foundation, but you are the best doctor for yourself and just trust that you know what you're doing and when it's time to be done or when it's not needed, um, that it's okay too. If you don't have a tongue scraper and aren't looking to buy one right now, um, I suggest using a metal spoon and you can just, you know, flip the spoon cup side and then scrape the tongue that way. It's kind of like the beginner's way to get into that. So that's so tongue pe- scraping. Are people doing that first and then brushing their teeth or are people brushing their teeth and then tongue scraping? I say tongue scrape first, brush teeth. And then if you're also going to add in something like oil pulling, you would do that after that. Awesome. I love to yeah. scrape. I just can't believe I live so much of my life without doing it. <laughs> no, no, it's a non-negotiable. 100%. So that's my, my tridoshic um, dinacharya. And then my tridoshic, do we want to do just do dinacharyas first? Oh. Or go through the, like, I have just a couple bits. I was going to share a, a pranayam and a little mantra. Yeah, let's do the pranayam and the, the mantra. Yeah, so, I mean, you know, students have been practicing with you. They probably already know that Nadi Shodana is a really good balancing practice. So just doing a little alternate nostril breathing can be a great way to start the day after you s- scrape the tongue. Just kind of take a moment and pause and, and balance the 
the energy, the hemispheres of the brain through alternate nostril breathing. And then the final thing that I have is a mantra that you can do before eating. And so a really nice Ayurvedic practice to do, I find, before we ingest whatever we're eating is to bless the food, to put a put a prayer on it, chant a mantra on it, take three breaths, just pause. Because oftentimes by the time we get to eat, we're like so hungry that we just like mindlessly shovel it in. Maybe that's in the car or in front of the TV or in front of a computer and it doesn't nourish us even if what you're eating is nourishing supposedly you know ayurveda suggests that it's more about how you digest it or how you eat it than it is about what you're eating so you know even if you're having something that doesn't feel ayurvedic if you just take a moment and and send some loving energy to it then and gratitude i think that it will it will nourish us still so the mantra is om hrim anapurnae namaha so Om Hrim is, is calling in um, Shri and the, the, the divine to, to bless the food. And Anapurnae is the, or Anna, Anapurna is the goddess of, of food, of, of blessing our food. So Ana means food, if we know the koshas and we know Anamaya kosha. Um, so yeah, I would just have hands over whatever I was about to eat. I'd take maybe a breath or two, close the eyes, and then you can just chant three times om prem anapurnaye namaha and you could do that silently as well like sometimes you know if you're like at a cafe and you're like i don't know if everyone needs to know what i'm doing over here you know you just like say it internally and i think that already just sets the the meal up a little bit more lovingly beautiful um, mm-hmm. So what I um, should say is for the pranayamas um, for this month, there'll be um, for every pranayama that Nikki recommends, there'll be a pranayama practice to correspond with it on the platform. Just mm-hmm. FYI. <laughs> um, so mm-hmm. who's next? Let's go to the king of all doshas, which is or the queen is Vata. Yeah, Vata, I think, tends for many of us to be out of balance, especially in this modern world where we're doing a lot of things that are destabilizing, and Vata really craves to be grounded. And so the practice that I recommend for Dinacharya for Vata is Abhyanga. So Abhyanga is just the work of a warm oil massage. And so if you can, you know, do your whole body, I have like a a little body oil that I'll I'll put on and a lot of times I can you know put it in hot water or put it in a crock pot or things like that to to heat it up um or just like be out here in Bali and it's good (laughs) uh and, and you know you would you would take that oil and you would um I like to start usually at the feet but it's harder to show my feet right now but you know your limbs are gonna rub towards your heart and the long bones you do nice like long massaging strokes and then you can just do circular strokes at the the joints and then just bring that up it's a it's a really nice way to to activate the lymph to ground the body there's lots of different oils you can do for different dosha types so abhyanga is really good for everybody but especially for vata um, a heavier oil like sesame oil can feel like an, a hug you know um yeah, oil oil is just like the most like loving things that, that we can do. Ayurveda kind of has an oil for like every part of the body possible. Um, but if time doesn't permit and you don't have like, you know, able to do like a full body abhyanga, I recommend just doing like the part of the body that's calling. Like I've been having really sore hands lately from driving the motorbike. And so I'll just like rub the, the oil like around my palm and massage the thumb and the fingers. I did a practice at night for a while where I just put the oil on my feet and just massaged my feet for a couple of minutes. It didn't feel like overwhelming. I think when we take on something that feels too big, we don't even start it. But if you're like, oh, I'm just going to rub a little oil on my shoulders and my neck. And then all of a sudden we're like in a whole decadent moment of like <laughs> playing soft music and rubbing our bodies and doing doing longer than we maybe thought we were. So Abhyanga is the practice that I have for great Vata pacifying Dinacharya. 
So with that, that, if somebody was doing a whole body massage, are -hmm. they working from the limbs in? Are they working from the feet up? Are they including the face and the head in that? Yes, great questions. Um, You would start, I like to start with the feet and go up the legs into the the waist and then do the arms into the mid body. And then with the belly, I like to massage in a, um, like if I look down at my belly, it's going in a clockwise direction and massaging um, the belly that way. It's, it's also really important, I think, to take some time with the breasts and especially, you know, women like taking circular motions and, and lovingly massage um, that, that area that tends to not really get looked out after or cared for. It becomes so sexualized that we think that um, to touch our bodies in that way feels maybe inappropriate. Um, so I can, I find that it can be really, really healing to, to spend some time on the breast and, and massage and, you know, take time to do all the like different circles and things that can be really, um, really nurturing. And then I would go up and do, do the neck and, um, and the throat. We have like a, so much lymph here that actually you know, the softer that you go would, is more helpful if you, what you're trying to do is move lymph, um, that you can, you know, massage through the back of the neck. I like to take hands on the, the fingertips on the throat and just kind of gently like press and pull down with the, the oil is nice. And then taking like Star Trek hands and going around the ear, you can do with the oil is really nice if you hold tension in the jaw. Um, you absolutely can put it on the face and the, and the head as well. There's like a whole nother practice called Shiradhara that you can get where you lay down and somebody administers hot oil or warm oil on the third eye, just dripping down. Um, I have yet to figure out how to do that to myself. So like, it's so lush. <laughs> yes. I'm going to do a punch of karma here in a couple of weeks. So I am really looking forward to having somebody do that for me. And, but yeah, you can, you know, of course, you can put the oil anywhere. You can massage it through the head, through the face, uh, through the ends of the hair, just depending on what you need, how much time you have. And I feel like there's no getting it wrong. You know, I feel like sometimes we get caught up like, oh my gosh, was it stomach clockwise or is this clockwise or is this clockwise? Like if you're doing it with this positive intention, um, don't get too caught up in like the logistics of it. And so one more question. Do you know off the top of your head, if somebody's like, I don't need my butter reduced, I need to reduce my pitta or my kapha, but I'm like totally down for this whole massage vibe, um, mm-hmm. what oils they might use? Yeah. So for um, pitta, a recommended oil would be something like coconut because it has a lot of cooling properties. So if you do have a sensitive skin or um, a lot of heat or redness in the skin, coconut oil can be good. I also find that um, jojoba oil or almond oil is nice. Um, Kappa would like something a little bit lighter and that has, um, you know, more, yeah, just a lighter oil. So something like um, mustard seed or a a safflower safflower oil can be really nice for, um, for kapha, this is a, a actually a tridoshic oil that I have here. And so it has sunflower, safflower, and sesame oil, along with a bunch of other um, essential oils. So that one's really nice. Awesome. What mm-hmm. is the um, pranayama and the mantra? Mm, yes. Uh, I find that vatas like something a little bit tangible. Vata so light. And so if we can do something gross like Brahmari, which has a sound to it and, you know, it kind of anchors you a little bit more easily than the lightness of pranayama. So Brahmari is just the bumblebee breath and, you know, getting yourself to hum and and hear yourself, I think, can be really soothing if you're feeling a little scattered, chaotic. The best thing as well for Vata, too, is to create a schedule for these things. So maybe you're like, Sunday night, I'm going to do my abhyanga and every night I'm going to turn off my devices on every or every Sunday. And at 7 PM after dinner, I'll do my abhyanga, get re- get ready for bed. And you can leave that oil on you to be careful because oil can stain. 
So you want to maybe have your abhyanga clothes that you put on after and just like let yourself be in that. Um, you can keep it on your body and let it soak through or you can wipe it off if, if it feels like it's still quite heavy on the body. So those are things to keep in mind um, as well. And then, you know, maybe Brahmari, like maybe that's the thing you do right after, uh, before bedtime. And every night before you go to bed, you just like hum to yourself for five minutes or for one minute even. And then the the mantra that is really um, nice, I think, would be soham, just to work with soham. Soham is so uh, grounding, you know, helps us to to gather all of the scattered pieces of the mind. And I know when I feel like so many things are going on, I feel that sense of overwhelm. I know that that's the path of Ivada. So soham can be a really nice mantra, you know, the sound of the breath, and also just that sound of that we that mantra that we get initiated into with with our first breath and yeah I think it can it can help Vata's um just anchor anchor to the present moment. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Um who's next? Let's go with Pitta. So Pitta Dina Charya, this is a practice that I just started doing maybe maybe six or six months ago or so in the last year. And again, I feel like, you know, we're putting them in a dosha, but honestly, I feel like everybody can benefit from all of these things. It's not like, oh, I'm, I'm mostly kapha and can't do this practice, but eye washing has changed the game. I've had to spend so many hours in front of the computer lately, um, planning courses and things like that. And my eye is so tired. And so many of us, whether we're in front of the computer for work or we're just on our phones all day long. Our eye is just like leak so much prana and like don't get much nourishment at all. And so I found that using um, an eye gullet, which is this cute tiny glass <laughs> here, uh, can can be a great way to get ready for bed or or a midday. Like you know, sometimes midday, like oh my god, I'm so tired of just staring at a screen. This is like my little refresh moment to feel bright again. Um, actually I actually have two refresh moments. So what I do with the, the eye wash is I have this floral water. You can also use rose water. I fill it maybe a dropper full of this, and then I'll just fill the rest with purified water or just water or whatever I have on hand. And what you would do with this is you'll cup the whole eye so that water won't leak, and then you just fully drop the head back. And then when the head drops back, you keep the eyes open and just blink several times, 20, 15 to 30 seconds, you know, again, decide what feels good for you. Um, in the beginning, it can feel a little burny and it was hard for me to do it. And I was like, Oh, I don't like the way it feels. And then I, after a week or so of doing it, it started to be like, Oh my gosh, I could do this for a whole minute and have this little goblet on. We suggest that you dump the water before doing the other eye. I've don't tell anyone, but like I typically will use the same one and just go for it on both eyes and just, you know, do, do the next eye. If you do have some kind of like eye infection or some gunk happening in the eye, if you're doing it maybe first thing in the morning, um, you would want to switch, swap out the water and do, do something fresh. You can also just wash your face before you do it. And as long as you don't have like any kind of eye situation, that one is really, really nice, really nice and, and cooling for, um, we have, uh, a sub sub dosha of, of pitta in our eyes. It's called alochaka pitta. So alochaka pitta can get like this nurturance if we cool it off with something like that. Um, and then one other thing that I love as a pitta pacifier is rose water. Rose is like really nice and cooling and calming as well. Pitta can often feel that energy of like agitation um, so that excess heat, like just like a rose water, like spray over the face and body can, can just be like, oh, calm down, calm down, little one. It's going to be okay. <laughs> Somebody doesn't have, um, fancy water. Is it mm -hmm. okay to do just like water from a tap? Maybe not in Bali, um, but in other places. I wouldn't. Yeah. If you had clean water coming out of the tap, you can, you don't have to use the fancy floral water or rose water you can just use plain water mm -hmm. yeah well, just make sure it's clean mineral water in the fridge or something obviously not sparkling 
<laughs> <laughs> I think as long as it's it's clean water. Okay. I, I haven't um I haven't experimented with cold temperature water before. I have done it with warm water because what you can also do is like I had a sty in my eye uh, several months ago and I had a triphala powder and I put triphala powder in water, let that steep for, I don't know, 20 minutes or something like that. And then um, sifted that out with a, a cheesecloth and I used the triphala water in my eye wash to help heal the sty, which it, it did. It like, you know, went away in a couple days with the, I, I wash like three times a day with the, with the triphala. So you could make a tea out of it. Like if you had a chamomile tea or a rose tea or something like that, you can make a tea and use that if you want to amp it up a little bit. <laughs> Amazing. Mm -hmm. Then what is the pranayama and the mantra? Yeah. So for, um, so for Pitta, Pitta wants a little bit of space. And so I'm just working with Savitri for that, for that, um, pranayam. So, you know, inhale for a, a ratio of two, hold for a ratio of one, exhale for the ratio of two, hold for one. And I find that can be really soothing and spacious for, for Pitta to bring in some, some pranayama. It's like really, really great medicine for, for Pitta. Um, the mantra for Pitta is no mantra <laughs> because I think that Pittas need silence. And so just a practice of silence once a day, once a week can be really, really, really soothing. Um, so, you know, if, if you can't, if you don't live alone or something like that, you can tell people like, Hey, I'm after 8 PM. I'm, I'm practicing silence tonight. If you can honor that, or maybe it's in the middle of your day, or maybe it's, I'm not going to go on social media because sometimes like that could be our form of communication, even though we're maybe not verbalizing something um, and taking a day off or an hour off or how, whatever that looks like for you. So yeah, I think silence can be a really nice ojas builder and a, a way to pacify Pitta. So just like zipping it up. You know, pittas sometimes are fast and have a lot of ideas and are just kind of like running, running it out the mouth and just holding it back and being maybe more taking some time of quiet and observation can be really nice. You know, I've been giggling at myself the whole time that you have said that because I have plenty of pitta and can think of all the times that I've become so goal oriented when it comes to my mantra practice. Like mm. now I'm like doing all of the mantras type thing, which is like obviously the exact opposite of the whole vibe. And then I was also thinking about like back in the day when I lived in Bali, mm -hmm. I for a while was doing silent Sundays. And I remember that. Do you remember? It was uh -huh. so funny. Funny though. I mean, it was beautiful. I loved it. I would like lay by the pool and I wouldn't be on gadgets for that day. Like if I was going to read a book, it would be like a physical book and it would be very lovely. And then sometimes my flatmate would do silent Sundays with me, sometimes not. But I, re I re remember this like one distinct time. It might've been my very first silent Sunday and I would break it with Kirtan on Sunday night. That would be how I would break it. It was lovely. But I remember one day my flatmate had been away for the day. I had done silent Sundays and I didn't realize like how much um, energy you waste through unnecessary talking and, you know, consumption of, you know, electronics or whatever. So by the end of Sunday, I would have so much energy, but I had been silent all day. And so I didn't quite realize. And I remember my flatmate got home one day and I just went like, <laughs> just like yep 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 and he just like stood there for ages and was like I think we just need to have a little conversation about how how you're going to break silence and like how you could approach me <laughs> and I was like wow I'm so sorry I didn't I didn't realize <laughs> Oh, that's great. That was a great mirror that he was for you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Um, so what do we have left? Kaffa. Yeah. 
Kaffa. Um, Kaffa, Kaffa, you know, is the, the most dense and needs the most invigoration. And so the dry brush or Garshana is going to be really, really lovely for, hold on, I just dropped my, my Garshana gloves on the floor uh, for, for Kaffa. I, um, I like to travel with the gloves because there are, there is a bigger dry brush that you could use as well. That's a, a little bit more intense. It's a little bit more rough on the skin. Um, and it also just is bigger and weighs more and things. So I, I bring my little gloves with me when I travel. Um, and you know, it's just like silk gloves and it just kind of gives you a little bit of, uh, exfoliation. And also I like to do this in the morning as like kind of a way to like be like we're waking up like good morning let's get things going and moving uh the same kind of rules apply as far as uh the abhyanga with the way that we would work the body as far as like going from the feet up moving always towards the heart if you're you know if you can find yourself on your back you know doing it that way and same thing with doing the belly clockwise around the breasts around the neck Avoid the face. It could be a little bit rough, especially with a dry brush. Definitely don't do that on, on the face. Um, and that can be really nice to, to exfoliate the skin, to, to energize the body. I actually got a dry brush for my face from my esthetician who shares, I, she's an um, Ayurvedic health counselor as well as an esthetician. So she has like all the cool little Ayurvedic skincare rituals for me. So this has been really nice as like a way, I'll just like sometimes just do it on my neck in the morning and then like run a brush through the, the face like boop, boop, boop. and it's kind of like a quick I don't have to spend you know gua sha can be like really beautiful but like it just takes a while you have to go quite slow and which can be nice maybe that's like what you need to do if your vata is out of balance but like coffees you're like come on let's we gotta get going so I, I like the little face brush has been has been good so yeah that's that's Garshana. And so if somebody's like, I don't happen to have silk gloves on hand, mm -hmm. is there something that they might already have around the house that they could use as an alternative? Yeah, I would say even just a towel. A towel you can um, do a little wet and, and, you know, just the exfoliation of a towel can be enough to um, massage and invigorate the body. Or if it's in your shower and you have one of those like loofah sponges or something like that, I think that could be really nice to, to wake up the body that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. So just like a towel, but maybe I'm thinking like, you know, silk is obviously quite lovely. So mm -hmm. if you're choosing something, it would not be a material that's like super abrasive. Um, I think actually a little, like a kind of a rough towel would be all right. Because, um, you know, I think, again, that's one of those things, like, listen to your body. If you're, like, rubbing this towel and you're like, oh, my God, this is so painful. Like, probably too scratchy of a towel. But if you have something that, you know, has, it's not silk. I think a silk or something like that towel would not really do the trick. Um, especially if you were to get it wet, it probably wouldn't feel like anything. So, um, you know. A regular, a good old regular face towel or, you know, dish size towel, that hand towel. Um, probably don't have, use your dish towel for also your Garshana. Maybe have something <laughs> separate for that. But I think that would be a, a really great way to um, just do something that you didn't have to buy external things for. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what is the pranayama and the mantra? Yeah, so pranayama, I have a little kapalabhati uh, with alongside a little Uddiyana Bandha, which bol which actually neither one is a pranayama. <laughs> so that was a that's a trick one for you all because kapalabhati is more of a purification technique. So it actually is really, you know it's one of the the shat kriyas. So one of these ways that we are essentially more of like a dinacharya where we're you know, working on purifying the body and, you know, getting all five of our senses super clean and bright so that we can take in life more, more clearly. But if we do, you know, something like Kapalabhati or Bastrika, that can be a really nice, bright way to, to start our day. 
And then Udiana Banda, which is a Banda, not a Pranayam, but needs to be done on an exhale retention, can be a nice way to um, start to invigorate the belly, the digestive system, release some serotonin, which kaphas could use a little bit more of to have that just bright, feel good hormone pulsing through the body to, to start the day. Amazing. Mm-hmm. And the mantra. So the mantra that I have is the Gayatri. So the Gayatri mantra is, you know, this this symbol of the, you know, the, the mother of all the, the mantras and this beautiful depiction of the radiance of the sun. And so the sun brings us prana and energy and enlivenment and nourishment. And so kappas could really benefit from having that mantra, I think, vibrating through through their being if if that's something that you choose to to work with whether that's through mantra japa or maybe again just a couple of rounds maybe that's before you eat or before you go to bed um, to chant the gayatri and just call in your inner sunlight and that luminosity letting that radiate more strongly from from your inner being awesome um i love the gayatri so much i know it just keeps getting sweeter Do you know when I chant it, it actually is like physically painful for me. (laughs) The thing is I've told you that I love it so much, but I have, and it only happens for me with the Gayatri, like especially if I'm doing, um, you know, the we've done it on uh, teacher training before where you will, there's the, um, and actually I'll pop this up on the platform as well for people, the external recitation of the Gayatri uh, 108 times and it's um you know quite a journey it takes about 37 minutes and I love doing it but every time I do it I get inner ear pain at the beginning and then I keep doing it and I end up having worked through it by the end and it's like beautiful by the end but at the beginning there's always inner ear pain and I don't get it with any other mantra that is so interesting yeah I wonder what that's about no, what is that, but I what is that I'm revealing like, to you? I don't know, but I actually said that and I was like, wow, Karina, you're really just divulging too much about all like your weird quirks in this. You should stop <gasps> that. <laughs> no, do more of that because we all have those weird things. And I think the more that we just share the the reality of it, then, you know, it, it, everyone else feels like, oh, it's okay that like this actually made me feel worse before it made me feel better. I'm not doing it wrong. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. Um, So then, pauses for dramatic effect. Um, So for each of these, so we know that the tridoshic practices are going to be good for everybody. For the, we've spoken about just briefly when it comes to the practices to reduce butter. So that could be for somebody if they're feeling ungrounded, if they're feeling a little bit scattered, they may be feeling more stressed or anxious than usual, finding it hard to concentrate, etc. That's when they might go, okay, so some of these vata reducing practices are going to um, be good for me. Could you Mm -hmm. sort of give those same markers for uh, people? So like, how do I know that pitta reducing practices are probably where I'm at at the moment? Or how do I know that kapha reducing practices are probably where I'm at at the moment? Yeah, totally. So for um, for Pitta, if we're finding that we're being a little bit overly intense, maybe competitive, maybe we're working really hard, burning the candle at both ends. Um, if we've been doing that for a while, that may show up that we're just impatient and a little irritable, more agitated. Um, yeah. So when we're when we're feeling that sense of like boiling heat like bubbling up and you know maybe you're a little snappy to to others not don't have as much capacity to to hold um that could be a sign that some of these these pata pitta pacifying practices will be helpful i think also on the physical level as well um you know if we see like a lot of redness in the skin or acne or if we're having indigestion and heartburn um, you know, for Vata physically, it will be if our skin is quite dry and we're feeling constipated or maybe very bloated and gassy. 
uh, those could be more physical signs of that, uh, as as well as those emotional signs that you that you mentioned. And then for kapha, we can, um, you know, look at that emotionally when we tend to feel, you know, kapha is made of earth and water, so it's the most dense. And when we start to feel that that heaviness, or feeling stuck, or lethargic, or lazy. Or just having difficulty getting moving and initiating a project or something like that. Um, that could be a sign that, that kapha is, needs a little bit of, of balancing. Um, physically, it can show up in, in us having excess mucus, maybe having like a wet cough or just being like a little bit more congested in the nose and having to blow our nose a lot. Um, it can show up as, um, Being, how do I want to put this? It can show up as just feeling like after we eat a meal that we're like, it's not like good and moving through us. And so we can feel like heavy after that. Maybe we're like, oh my gosh, I I have to take a nap immediately after I eat. And, um, you know, sometimes that that requires um, us to just notice like, ah, oh, stool is a little bit mucusy or like smeary when we're wiping or things like that. Th- that's all like kapha being a little bit um, too much. So is there anything else that people should know before we wrap up? Um, I think I think just to reiterate that to not get too caught up in all of the rules of, of Ayurveda. I think I know for me in the beginning of learning all this and still sometimes it feels so like regimented and like, how do I know I'm like, do I have to pass up my, my vata or my kapha today? Or is it like pitta at the wheel and trying to n- negotiate that? And I mean, all of these practices are really good for everyone in moderation and, and just depending on. So Dry brushing is good for everyone. Maybe vata, you only need it once a week. And kapha, you need it every other day. And pitta needs it two to three times a week. And so I would say all the practices that I said specifically for each dosha, you can uh, adjust it so that it works. Like, oh, I'm going to do abhyanga once a week. Or I'm going to do eye washing twice a week instead of every day and, and things like that. So Again, just trusting your own intuition of like what you're reaching for, what you're feeling in need of, um, and just playing. Let's be, you know, we're, we're the, the best, um, people to experiment on. So seeing what's working, what makes you feel better and do more of that. I think that's so awesome because it's, I think that takes the pressure off like, oh, I've got to pick the right practice because I'm only allowed to do this practice. And it's like, Mm -hmm. no, no can like be responsive day to day that's fine yeah yeah it's like you know i learned so much of like do this for 40 days and do nothing else and while that can be really helpful in some scenarios i think for some of these like dinacharyas it's kind of like a day-to-day like it's a great way to check in of like you know it shows up of what our past was um in our bodies today so we can really remain present and be like oh Normally my pit is out of balance, but today, man, I am like heavy and lethargic and I actually got to tend to, to kapha today. And while that might not be my daily practice, but like today we're going to, we're going to sweat a little bit and we're going to dry brush and um, I need to do some neti pot. <laughs> I actually think you just said something that like so briefly that I think is so important, which is like your past shows up in your body and mm-hmm. this like, body is actually your sort of like material memory. And it's like what you're experiencing today is the effect of choices that you've made previously. And so this Mm -hmm. is something that allows you to like ameliorate the negative impact of past choices. Yeah. I mean, I think that's like what's so beautiful about adding in Tantra into everything as well, where it's like, there's no good or no bad. It's not right or wrong. It's like, well, your choices are just going to affect you later. So how do you want to be affected? You know? So if you're like, gosh, my ankles are really swollen from that you know all the french fries i had yesterday like i'm feeling like a lot of kapha in my body through this edema and it's like okay well maybe today you're not gonna also have like a bag of chips or like add a bunch of soy sauce on something or you know like keep this the sodium down and that's gonna 
help to inform the choices that we make now to balance, you know, it's like every single moment we get to make a new choice of how we want to feel later. I think that's really nice because at the same time you can be ameliorating like the negative impact of a choice that has caused you to feel a little bit of out of, out of balance today. The choice that you're making today to do the Ayurvedic practice is going to set you up nicely, like set future you up nicely. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, I know like today I'm starting my retreat. Like I wanted to make really good choices for myself. Like in the last 24 hours specifically knowing I'm about to hold space for a lot of people whereas like right after I ended my last thing I was like get me a burger and french fries and maybe a glass of wine <laughs> and not and not have any like guilt or shame around that because yeah that that's what actually was my medicine at that time for that day and if I did that every single day that would start to not feel good at all but for that day it was like oh uh, this is this is what I needed. Awesome. So if people want to get in contact, if they have questions, if they want to consult, um, what is the best way for them to contact you? Yeah, so you can either go to my website, nikkini.com, N-I-K-K-I-N-I-E. You can follow me on Instagram and send me a message there. It's at Nikki underscore N-I-E underscore. Um, and, you know, that's probably the the quickest way, you know, through my website, you can send me an email. Um, you can, you know, take any of my on-demand classes on wavelength movement and see if maybe some questions get answered through some of those classes. And um, I think I have, I'll have a, a fall or spring, depending on what hemisphere you're on, cleanse coming up in a, a couple months. That'll probably be the next like group activity that, that I'll put out there. So that would be a good way as well to learn more about this stuff. Awesome. Thank you so much for doing this today, especially. I know it's a big day and you're about to um, go and lead a retreat. So I really appreciate <laughs> you and I appreciate your time in particular on this day. My pleasure. Always a treat to get to chat with you. <laughs>